Thank you very much for meeting today. And thank you and your whole team for the amazing work you've already done in presenting the video of this exhibit, especially for the thought, care, and professionalism that created these words and images for us all to share. In the catalog itself, <clears throat> in the article in Floriat Domus, and in the demonstration of the work by Aisha Olabaji and Naomi Tiley, in what went into the creation of this video and the presentation of the exhibit itself, where we learned about specific documents like this map of the island of Barbados, with all of its detail, including some rather vicious moments encapsulated, not talked about in the text, but embedded in the documentation. Seamus Perry presented a, an amazing presentation of the territorial tradition at Bale Island and Oxford in general by inviting us to look at primary sources like this book of poetry in the second edition by Robert Southey, Balliol student, and reading from that book, drawing our attention to specific phrases like sip this blood-sweetened beverage, which made it clear that there was a struggle in the abolition movement against sugar, the consumption of sugar, the sugar boycott, which was used to sweeten the beverages like coffee produced at the time from also export agriculture. A very sensitive reading of a very powerful poem. In addition, in the tutorial tradition, the article drew our attention to what Marisa Fuentes called and emphasized, called us to think about what was missing elaborating on what she called the negative space of the record, the fact that the record doesn't talk much about the labor and the suffering behind the images that are nonetheless present. And she and Naomi and others in the team pose the question directly, how can we revive the power stolen from those overlooked or erased from the historical record? Well, in the digital age, there are powerful new possibilities at Balliol. The Bodleian and librarians working throughout Oxford to enhance the work of scholars, professional librarians themselves, and students at all levels, undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral students, students doing second doctorates. New forms of cooperative, collective, and cumulative research can now be conducted across boundaries that were, in fact, barriers previously, but are now easy to transcend with an appropriately assembled collection of digitized material. Furthermore, this does not confine itself to the UK. Once the documents are digitized, libraries around the world can be invited to join in webinars, seminars, lecture series, and look at the implications of this for both local, UK, and global history. This is what was done in Ghana not long ago, the University of Cape Coast which invited people to submit papers on recovering the looted past. Repatriation was the theme of the conference. And we looked at digitizing historical maps, images, and artifacts to enhance global collaborative research on what had been looted from areas of Africa. African historical cartography came in for a big focus because it's the old maps plus the digital technology 
that now creates new communities of people that can elaborate new narratives in African and global history. Marissa Fuentes emphasized that's what she felt she was doing, elaborating on the negative space of the record, looking back at what is not recorded in the texts, but is in fact being recorded in the other aspects of the documents. Much has been written, and now much more can be discovered by enabling new communities to examine unvoiced evidence in Balliol's historical books, collections, maps, and pictures. This is what Thomas Hodgkin taught us decades ago. A fellow at, the Bail at Balliol at the time, Thomas Hodgkin came to the United States in 1964, where I first met him. When I was still in my pre-college years, I was in high school in America when I heard him speak and give suggestion to those of us wanting to work in Africa and the Middle East. From his own experience, he suggested that we should go to where the silence is, listen to what they are saying, but dare not speak. Find your voice, he said, and learn to speak what they are not allowed to say. So, it's in this vein that we developed the idea of creating this proposed Hodgkin collection within the Balliol and Empire project started in 2019. We can give it the temporary title of Hearing the Voices of the Silenced. That's what we wish to celebrate in his tradition of research. Go to where the silence is. Listen to what they are saying, but dare not speak. Find your voice and learn to speak what they are not allowed to say. In this regard, Catherine and I were particularly encouraged to hear details from Richard Norman about the Balliol College Library Collection Development Policy and what it establishes it as, as a set of procedures for a solo cataloging system and the handling of documents at Balliol, uh, the Bodleian, and the linked Oxford libraries. <clears throat> so, this is the idea behind the proposed collection, and we wish to draw your attention to different aspects of it. In summary, you can click on this and get a summary view of some of the photographs, um, just a, a smattering of them, but it may be useful to take a look briefly. Historically important rare books are included in this proposal. Books like this, which are themselves quite interesting because of the history they've had. In this case, it's a book on the Relation de Voyage du Royaume d'Isigny, on the Côte d'Or, as it was referred to, the Gold Coast, Pays de Guinée en Afrique. It was owned and used for a while in the Société Belge d'études coloniales. Why were the Belgians interested in an old document, an old book uh, written by the French? Well, that's part of a later period of the scramble for territory in Africa. But the book itself is of great interest because of what it shows and what it doesn't show and what it represents. These are not photographs, obviously. These are iconographic representations of what was going on in this area and what was present in this area. Now, what was present in this area, according to the observers recording the text, <clears throat> but also giving us an image of it, is that people had camels, horses, and cattle. Well, is that in fact true? That's the kind of thing we can start to investigate. Draft animals were absent from this part of West Africa. So this may be totally imaginary and very misleading. <clears throat> Similarly, the botanical history of the area can be examined. And it can be examined in reference to other voyage accounts, in this case, islands in the Americas. Um, what's the 
content of material in this part of the world, well, again, the focus on plants is very interesting, seashells, among other things. Um, and these items can be looked at in volumes that are very small, which itself is very interesting as a problem. Israel de Voyage was a series of encapsulations of uh, studies done by people in this part of the world on different aspects of colonial possessions. These books often contain maps that were much larger than themselves, had to be folded up several times, and included in these small volumes. Maps of whole regions and maps of specific areas, like the River Gambia, which we saw earlier. These, in fact, can be shared and looked at historically now as part of the printed maps. The individual maps, in which case there are many, are, have been separated from the books that they were initially published in. And yet they're not useless because of that separation. On the contrary, they can be studied in great detail with, in effect, new forms of, of investigation. Here you can see a fort, for example, a French fort. Um, here is an indication of the kingdom of Fida, or Wida, as it's called, and an indication of the internal river and lagoon system going up along this whole area, which is labeled as one being dangerous for landing. This is a very detailed map that leads us to understand a whole lot about the trading systems along the coast this time. And it's this kind of map that can be studied in conjunction with other maps like this one, for example, in South Africa, that details not only the fort, but particular history of the gardens around the fort. In this case, you can see that the gardens are quite extensive, and the annotations, at least graphically, are very detailed, with indications both in French and in Dutch. A very interesting theme. Why are there two languages being used here? Well, these are the kinds of things you can explore along with historical prints. Prints represent, again, not photographs, but representations by artists, usually in Europe, not having ever traveled to West Africa, nevertheless, drawing things on the basis of sketches that they've seen and been told about by mariners, uh, shipmen, botanists who may have accompanied the trading ships to the coast. And these engravers start engraving particular plants, animals, fish, birds, and practices. Very interesting history of the introduction of new crops into West Africa, like manioc, along with the techniques needed to prepare it, are detailed in these kinds of prints. The outside rind of manioc is poisonous. It's a new world crop. And it's very useful, especially to get slaves used to eating it before they arrive in America. To get them used to eating it, there needed to be plantations of it grown within West Africa, and the techniques for preparing it and removing the poisonous outer rind was very necessary. It's basically scraped into a mealy form, soaked, and the poisonous elements of its surrounding rind are completely leached out of it when it is then dried out and 
made into a kind of meal, which can be baked into cakes. This is a very useful new crop introduction to West Africa because it's what they call desiccatable. That is to say, you can dry it out and then add water to it when you need to and stir just as any good military system works on rations, so does the slave trade. Add water and stir is your way of moving a food supply over great distances without having to carry its water content. One of the other big innovations was another American crop introduced to West Africa, and in fact, rips across the whole of Africa in a very short period of time, and that is maize what Americans often refer to as corn. The British use corn to describe any grain, but Indian corn, as it's indicated in this plantation, is Indian corn brought in from the Americas. There's also cotton brought in from the Americas. C is Indian corn, and <clears throat> There's a native um, drying of timber. The corn cobs can be fed to animals and you can create a new economy of bee production as well as support new human populations off a desiccatable food supply, which again can be dried out, made into meal and reconstituted into breads. It's very important aspect of the ethnobotany of the slave trade that needs to be investigated and fortunately can now be investigated through collections like this. So you can peruse that and look at different examples of it from the different kinds of documents provided. You can also annotate those documents and more to the point, you can ask students to annotate the documents, looking particularly at questions that occur to them when they look at them. They can mark up a digital copy of something without any fear of ruining the original and learn a lot by asking questions, not only of the professors, but other students who may have greater knowledge. Again, here's something published in Dutch down here and has French titles on the top. Why does that occur? What's going on here? Again, these aren't photographs, but they are iconographic representations. This one's a very famous one of, as we'll see if we look more carefully, in effect, some workers paddling other populations out to be sold and delivered to ships that are awaiting their arrival. Who are these ships? Well, again, in the iconography at the time, you'd have to look for the symbolism on the ships, which you can do in great detail in the document that has been scanned in at 300 or 600 dots per inch. What you get is a representation of the Sun King known at the time, <laughs> Louis XIV. Um, and there's the crest of the Fleur de Lis and Louis XIV himself, the Sun King. These are not photographs, but they're very instructive, iconic statements that need to be deciphered. In the first instance, you've got to spend time figuring out what's being said and then why is the author or the person who commissions the engraving wanting to say that kind of statement to the world in these publications? This is the kind of thing that can be looked at in detail, as can details about the conditions being reported on the coast itself. Take a look at this one, for example, which shows up in a document that's called a geography. This was engraved for 
Middleton's complete system of geography. It's presented with putti and frames and a very elegant presentation of what? Well, a threefold representation of different things, one, two, three, which is explained below as indicating the dress of the female inhabitants of Ouida on the Gold Coast. One, women of rank. Two, women of lower class. And three, slave. Now you can see what the icons for each are presented as. Those of a upper class are presented with headdresses as well as elegant gowns. Those of lower class have flowing head coverings, but not headdresses. And slaves are represented as taking care of children and being bare-breasted, basically. Well, this is a piece of representation. This is not a photograph. It's a representation on the part of the engraver of something that he who paid the engraver wanted to get across. Namely, there's a class division within West Africa, very clear class division, with different roles uh, played by different people. Now, you can take this through to the ethnobotany of things like, take a look. This is one we mentioned earlier, the manioc root, which if you look at it is labeled here, along with potatoes, by the way, um, which don't do too well as introductions from the New World. Potato is a New World crop as well. Uh, what's referred to here as the cotton tree is not clear. This is where re more research is needed. Is this the kind of cotton that we think of in terms of export fiber for textiles, or is it a different kind of cotton? This one is very interesting. It's called Wheda peas. Now, Wheda peas were described to this engraver as something that grew on the ground in little sacks. The person who described it to them didn't describe that they were each in little sacks, like peanuts underground, as we know them, ground nuts, but said they grew in a sack underground. Well, not having ever seen one of these things, the engraver back in Europe, a very famous one, by the way, you can find out his history, uh, the sculpture, they, they, um, they indicate him here, uh, drew them all in one big sack. Well, it's a good example of how very expert engraving techniques are used by people who are very uninformed of what is actually meant by what they're studying. So you can look at these images in detail and learn a great deal. And you can look at the fortifications in great deal uh, more and learn a great deal more about them, especially when they are cataloged in this kind of way. This document, again, made by the French in this case, in effect, is making an appeal to the French. As you can tell from the title, a view of the description of the forts that the Dutch, the English, and the Danish have on the Gold Coast, on the coast of Guinea. And then the argument is, there are Dutch, English, and Danish forts, but no French forts. The argument of the author of this tract is basically to say we have to have French forts. And he's trying to appeal to his viewers in 1719, 1720, um, to invest in creating these kind of late medieval castles uh, for the slave trade in West Africa. Now, this is fascinating because it's given even more detail in projects like this. This is a map that's printed about 40 years, well, actually only 20 years later, in um, 1753. And it's been called one of the most important, 100 most important maps in American history. Well, why would that occur? Essentially, because it gives details about all of these slaving forts which its author initially wanted to emphasize 
was crucial for the British to get involved in the slave trade more thoroughly. So when it was published in 1753, the argument was, there is a lot going on down here, but not enough are installations made by the British. Most of them are Dutch and Danish, and in some cases French, but not British. So the author of the map initially argued that there had to be a greater British presence, that some of the forts the British initially occupied had been abandoned and they should be revived and revitalized as part of this profitable trade in 1750s. Well, as it turns out, about 80, 70, 80, that is about 30 years after this, 30 to 40 years after its initial publication, the same map is used by abolitionists to say, this is absolutely outrageous. Look at the concentration of slaving forts along this narrow band. Just imagine what suffering goes on. We have to stop the whole slave trade on the basis of look at its vast and important impact in from Cape, Cape Three Points, as it's called, right up through Dahomey or Wida. Um, there's also a description of the coastal currents and an indication of where this all fits within a larger framework of West African trade. There's so many things going on in this area that the author invents an insert to give you detail, a kind of innovation in the cartographic history of this area. Anyway, these are the kinds of things you could look at in detail and study, among other things, in their context. Now, we've seen this picture before, and in many respects, it now is something you can analyze uh, for its subtlety, but it's published along with another part of the print, which isn't normally commented upon. And that is part A. Part B had to do with Negro canoes carrying slaves on board ships at Bamfro. But part A, which is above here, is fishing canoes at Mina, five or 600 at a time. Now that's staggering. And it begs the question, anybody looking at that is going to say, listen, this is more than fishing for the evening meal. This is something rather serious. It could be even considered an industry, except it's not mechanized. It's an, an in form of industrious activity, not industrial activity. And this is an argument that has now become prevalent in looking at African history. Africa underwent an industrious revolution in order to make Europe's industrial revolution possible. That's the kind of serious study we can now undertake with documentation that's been left to us in this print form. So it's important to get these things in the hands of people who can start to analyze them and talk about the differences, talk about the introduced crops like cocoa or maize, talk about things like this, the inserts to a map, which indicate the towns that are owned by various kings and emphasizes these islands and parts adjoining make great quantities of salt and produce most the most part of the rice used in the factories, the land being low and proper for that grain. Well, these are the lands around the Gambia River. And that's where a great deal of the rice is grown, a desiccatable food supply, which you can use to add water and stir, and carry at great distances from the point of production, and then reconstitute by boiling it in water. That is a major source of the transatlantic food system that enables the slave trade to take place. 
In the 19th century, the images changed substantially and Africans are presented in far more um, childlike terms. In fact, childish terms. In Africa, they've been trading for guns and powder for hundreds of years, but by the 19th century, they're represented as being fascinated like children in this, oh, new powerful technology, right? Everyone gather around, see this. Well, this is not quite the novelty it's presented as here. Also, other things are being said in this image about alcohol. And, as we'll see, about tobacco. Now, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms are the addictives. Either physically addictive, as in women getting addicted to tobacco, for example, or alcohol, for that matter. And the social addictive are the firearms. By that, I mean, once you start buying firearms and guns and powder, and your competitors down the coast also buy guns and powder, you get caught in an arms race. You can't not buy more guns and powder because those who have the guns and powder can enforce their will upon you, capture you and sell you into slavery for more guns and powder, all with the payment of gold. This is represented in the 19th century imagery in the popular literature as something that in effect underscores both the stupidity and the childishness of African populations. And you can see from the title that this is something indicated of the Ashantis. The Ashantis are buying muskets with gold dust at Assini. Now, Assini is exactly what we referred to earlier as Isini in that earliest French document. So there's this kind of trade going on according to the producers of this image, which appears in the popular press in a journal known as The Graphic in the 19th century, very different from the presentation of African populations in the 18th century. Okay, well, you can explore these things on your own, and you can ask the kinds of questions, explore the kind of topics that occur to any historian. What's the role of the map or the print in any of this kind of thing? It's, in effect, a statement of intention or an effort to convince readers of something. First and foremost, though, it records things. It records things that weren't intended to be understood at the time, because that wasn't the subject they were focusing on. But any viewer of them can't help but ask the question, why? Well, because these structures are enormous, massive, and they don't get built on their own. So what's the embedded labor in the creation of these big castles? A poet puts this very powerfully in the 20th century in a poem you may have read. In any case, you can get access to it called A Worker Reads History. Who built the seven gates of Thebes? The books are filled with the names of kings. Was it the kings who hauled the craggy blocks of stone? And Babylon, so many times destroyed, who built the city up each time? In which of Lima's houses, that city glittering with gold, lived those who built it? In the evening, when the Chinese wall was finished, where did the Masons go? Imperial Rome is full of arcs of triumphs. Who reared them up? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Byzantium lives in song. Were all her dwellings palaces? And even in Atlantis, the legend, the night the seas rushed in, the drowning men still bellowed for their slaves. 
Well, a poem like that helps us focus, in a sense, on the unanswered questions, the unposed questions, the unintended questions of the historical record. So it's not just the worker reads history, a worker rereads history and enables us all to reread history, especially with places like this. Take a look. The transatlantic slave trade that existed between the 16th and 19th centuries was as catastrophic as it was extensive. This is Ghana's Atlantic coast, and I've come here to give you a sense of just how many European nations were involved in the slave trade. There are more than 30 old slave trading forts along a 250 kilometer stretch of beach today built by various European powers. Cape Coast Castle was built by the Swedes in 1653, but it changed hands five times over the next 11 years, ending with the British. Now, when the castle was originally built, it wasn't done very well. The roofs would leak, the ceilings were pretty dodgy, and the walls were quite insecure that they could even collapse. And so the whole castle was rebuilt in the mid-1770s. Well, there are a number of errors in that particular narrative, a very well-informed narrative otherwise, and one of the BBC's latest attempts to talk about the slave trade. But let's listen again, and I'll stop a few times at points that are problematic in the embedded assumptions of the narrator. The transatlantic slave trade that existed between the 16th and 19th centuries was as catastrophic as it was extensive. This is Ghana's Atlantic coast, and I've come here to give you a sense of just how many European nations were involved in the slave trade. Okay, she came to explain how many European nations were involved in the slave trade. doesn't focus on how many African people were involved in it or what their role was and doesn't at all comment on the fact that all the guns are pointed out to the sea, right? Very interesting detail not commented upon with the evidence right in back of her. There are more than 30 old slave trading forts along a 250 kilometer stretch of beach today built by various European powers. Ah, well, that's an interesting assertion. More than 30 forts along a very short period of, or short period in historically and short distance geographically of the coast. Why there? Why not further east? Why not further west? Doesn't answer those questions, but indicates that they were built by Europeans. Well, that's problematic in itself. It even gets worse. Cape Coast Castle was built by the Swedes. Well, you got to ask yourself, <clears throat> how many ships of Swedes would it have taken when? In 1653. But... In 1653 to build this castle. First of all, they wouldn't have been able to build it in 1653. They could have started to build it. But more importantly, it wasn't Swedes who built it. It was the embedded labor of African enslaved populations. It changed hands five times over the next 11 years, ending with the British. Now, when the castle was originally built, it wasn't done very well. The roofs would leak, the ceilings were pretty dodgy, and the walls were quite insecure that they could even collapse. And so the whole castle was rebuilt in the mid-1770s. Okay, the whole castle was rebuilt in the 1770s, and the reason for that had to do with the fact that the British had other revolts in other colonies that they were trying to suppress. So in West Africa, they were ramping up their attention to the slave trade 
in order to defeat the American Revolution, which was paid for by troops, <clears throat> mercenary troops hired in Germany to fight the American colonists. It's well recorded in the documents as well. And in fact, poets write it into poetry that reveal the shot heard around the world as that fired by an American against the British. So the problem of slavery in the age of revolution is something that's been a focal point of historians for quite some time. And you can look at it in detail through documents like this and through the access they can provide you to other kinds of documentation. Suppose you go out to Google Earth, for example, and call up some of this material. You can see it from space. This is how these images were obtained in the first place. They're shots from space <clears throat> that can be viewed and, in fact, zeroed in upon. You can view them at various manifestations and magnifications and even look at them in detail by parachuting in <clears throat> to the local prints of these things and starting to look at them in terms of what they are on the ground. Let's go back for a moment and parachute in at a different spot. If you look at these in detail, you can ask what does it look like, say, from here? And look at, again, the same structure of cannons pointed out to the sea. <clears throat> In this case, cannons with specific identification on them of Rex George, George the King. King George the Third was the king at the time these cannons were smelted and deployed here in West Africa to obtain enough cash to pay for the German mercenaries to defeat the American colonists. So history takes on a whole new global fascination, especially the history behind forts that weren't preserved were bombed and gutted from the very first time. You can see the embedded labor in something like this. It's just extraordinary. So the invitation to explore the topics of maps, stones, and plants is just overwhelming. Some of us have written about this, about the steps towards an ecology of imperialism, looking at it in terms of ecological history, as well as environmental history, socio-political history, and even cultural history. You can ask, what does Bach have to do with the slave trade? And the answer is not much, in fact, nothing directly. But the Brandenburgs did have a lot to do with the slave trade. At the time, in 1648, the Brandenburg territory was part of a range of kingdoms, including the Kingdom of Sweden, which you'll remember <clears throat> was the origin of the Cape Coast Castle investment. And <clears throat> the study of cartography itself is an extraordinary extension, in a sense, of the study of the art, science, history, botany, and discovery of the basic laws of nature in the 18th century, in effect, the Enlightenment. Maps during the Enlightenment, whether they're collected from Ottoman sources, or derived from European art historians are in fact the topic that can unite 
people in the study of global history, how parts of the world from Quebec to West Africa are linked in a new kind of universal series of sciences claiming to understand the world as a whole. Well, there's plenty of work to be done in this realm with greater attention to the specifics of individual countries and contributions, especially as the upper classes in European society use atlases as a way of stating power and maintaining power. Well, this is something we can look at in detail now with, in effect, the hidden record that's right before our eyes. This is not hidden in any physical sense, but it's something we haven't paid attention to until now, until the digital moment. So there's many topics that we can explore and include subjects about what happened to the slave populations after the slave trade was abolished. What happens during the early colonial period to the slave enslaved populations? This is the study that was undertaken at length about the French colonial conquest of the Central Ivory Coast, but <clears throat> nobody's asked in great detail how the indigenous population viewed what was going on. Since colonial rule, topics have to do with agriculture and the impact, long range impact, of this export tradition of agriculture, Africa's industrial revolution and the Atlantic empires, looking at the prior plantations and the origins and functioning of the Atlantic system. These prior plantations, the legitimate trade, cash crop exports, and farmland grabs are chapters in the continuity of African agricultural history that's quite vulnerable at this point. And of course, there's a great documentation about the continuity of enslaved populations during this period and well after the colonial period itself, leaving populations especially vulnerable to global climate change. Something that's been investigated now for 30 years with great detail in West Africa, looking at the decline of the ecologies of self-supporting systems in West Africa and the movement to the coast of populations that are now very vulnerable ever since the slave trade to any changes in the climate regime. They've in effect become marginalized, not because they're less important, but because they've moved to the margins of the continent as a result of 400 years of trading. This has led to a very sad circumstance with particular cash crops like slavery involved with chocolate. And there is a global movement of populations in the trafficking from south to north. So see, these are some of the categories of materials that can be explored with the new material available in digital form. Thank you very much.